night, <clears throat> I mentioned a couple, a lot of questions about the significance of observing Yom Kippur. Why fast? Why wear white when traditionally fasting in the scripture, you wear sackcloth? Um, a couple other things is that why is it the holiest day of the year when Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Hadin? That's the highest day technically of the year. So shouldn't we observe Yom Kippur before Rosh Hashanah? A couple questions like that that need a lot of, need some serious answers to. And one of the things that I sort of really drove home last night, the point was the misconception uh, that Jewish people don't need a mediary, an intermediary. As I mentioned, anti-missionaries are a big proponent of this theory. But yet, as I explained very thoroughly last night, the Torah supports Moshe as an intermediary. His brother Aaron was an intermediary. Every high priest after Aaron was an intermediary. The prophets were intermediaries. There was always someone taking the place of someone else. Some type of substitute was involved. And I shared a fabulous insight from the Ram Chal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato, the famous Italian rabbi from Padua, Italy, that brought the concept that really, that Olam Haba, the world to come, is reserved for a very, very few. That didn't sound too shocking to anyone, because even Yeshua says that many are called, but few are chosen. And he explained that when human beings don't have that merit, their own righteousness to get into Olam Haba, there is another way in. That's by cleaving to what's called a Zadik, a very righteous person, which in this case would be the Messiah. He is the one that enables them to get in. It's not just that you get a free pass, but because you are connected to him as a source of life, Machor Chaim, which is the name of this message. And so picking up from where I started off last night, the question is, some people may ask, why is it important to be connected with the Mashiach in order to be sealed for life on Yom Kippur? Is that relevant? Why can't I just go to shul, beat my chest a couple times at the achet, say a couple of you, and then fast, give a little zedakah, and that's it, I'm okay. Why must I be connected with the Mashiach? And the other question is, how is Yom Kippur any different from any previous Yom HaKippurim or any future Yom HaKippurim that are to come? How is it any different? Another very interesting tidbit that sheds light onto this day and also connected with Rosh Hashanah is that the sages, they teach that man's judgment is decreed on Rosh Hashanah and their fate is sealed on Yom Kippur. So in other words, God inscribes what your judgment is going to be 10 days ago, and then he's going to seal it tonight at the Nila, the closing of the gates when everything is finished. Shop is closed till next year. So in other words... What the sages are saying is that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are a two-step judgment process. However, I bring this up because this, this teaching by the sages are basically permeate every synagogue at this time right now in the Jewish world. However, with that saying that they're teaching they taught upon, a couple sentences later, they say something else. They say three books are open by Hashem on Rosh Hashanah, one for the completely wicked, one for the completely righteous, and one for the Benoni, what's called middle people. The completely righteous are inscribed and sealed for life. The completely wicked are inscribed and sealed for death. The Benoni, they're left hanging. They're suspended from Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur. And they go on to say, if they, a reference to the Benoni, are found to have any form of merit, they are inscribed for life. If they are not found to have merit, then they are inscribed for death. Now, I want to explain something. The concept of multiple books, or at least three books, be open on, on the day of Rosh Hashanah is a well-developed thought in Judaism. It's not something that Chazal thought of in the city of Yavni and the destruction of the temple to try to create a rabbinic thing. It's well-developed. In fact, in Sefer Hikalut, the book of Revelation, we read in chapter 20, verse 12, Yochanan says, And I saw, Vayere et hametim, I saw the dead, the small and the great. The reference to the small means wicked, the great is a reference to the righteous. Having taken their stand before the throne, and books, Sifrim, 
It's multiple. We're open. And another Sefer was open. The Sefer HaChaim, the book of life. And the dead were judged by the things having been written in those books according to what you've done. So what Chazal is bringing down is not something that was just thought up in a bubble after the temple times. This is something that permeated every single Jew. They understood what this day represent. In fact, just to give you a little heads up, there's various passages in Scripture that supports the idea of books of judgment. For instance, in Tehillim, Psalm 69, 28, David says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not to be written with the righteous. Which Chazal says that there's a book of the righteous open and sealed. Daniel chapter 12, 1 says that after Michael, the Malik that guards Israel, stands there, he says, at that time, your people, the Jewish people, everyone who was found written in the book, the book of righteous will be saved. Also, we find in Uri, the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, 20. Mashiach says that when a person comes to the knowledge of the kingdom, they are recorded in Hashemai, in the heavenly world. They're being written in some type of book. Also, later in Philippians, chapter 4, 3, Shaul speaks where he says, the rest of my fellow workers, those who partake in spreading the Besorah Mashiach, Names are written in the book of life. Also, Revelation 3, 5. Mashiach says if a person is not doing his will, they'll be erased from the book of life. And so the sages are saying that in Rosh Hashanah, both the righteous and wicked have been booked. Their tickets have been booked for a vacation. Some for life, some for death. But that the Bayonim, this middle class of people... They're left hanging until Yom Kippur, and depending on their merit, meaning if they're worthy of life or death, that will be the sermon on Yom Kippur, the final day. It should also be pointed out that the merit is associated with righteousness. A person's salvation, being sealed, is connected with righteousness. In other words, the Baonim experience life or death based on their righteousness. The question is, how is this possible when our righteousness, according to Yeshayahu, is like a filthy rag? And if any of you know the reference to that filthy rag, you know it's a very repulsive thought. Not a very nice image to paint. And even then, if a person were to claim to be righteous, they're not exempt from sin. As Solomon says in Colette 720, Shaul brings down in Romans 3.10 and in Romans 3.23. So how in the world the Baonim life is dependent on their righteousness? This also goes back to a question I asked last night. If Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Hadin, the day of judgment, then why is it observed before Yom Kippur, which is called the holiest day of the year? Shouldn't we observe Yom Kippur first, then Rosh Hashanah? Should not Rosh Hashanah be the holiest day of the year? It seems logic, but as I explained last night, it's illogical to think that way. It's backwards thinking. If, according to the sages, both the righteous and the wicked are sealed on Rosh Hashanah, what is it with this third group called the Baonim, this middle class of people? How is it that they're hanging, literally suspended, and their judgment has been postponed until Yom Kippur? Which Yom Kippur? Last year? 50 years? 50 years from now? Which one? What does this mean? Once again, Yom Kippur is not Yom Hadin. It's not the day of judgment. Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment. How are these Baonim hanging? How are they hanging? This is another thing I, I've, I've struggled. What are they hanging with? Is, is it a figure of speech? Like many of you know in the English idiom, we say uh, a phrase, it's hanging in the balance. No, it's not a figure of speech because Hebrew idioms are not the same as English idioms. So what are these Baonim hanging on? A pole? I don't know. What are they hanging on to? A hanger? Does it mean Hashem puts them up in his closet? 
on a hanger until he decides to get with them later and he pulls them out. They're just hang there. The sages uses the word talia, which means suspension, literally postponement. And therefore, a person is, is, it's a reference to hanging, almost like a person could be hanging on the gallows until they die. It's like they're in the position of death, but yet death hasn't been decreed. They're there. Besides trying to figure out who are these Baonim and what are they doing hanging out until Yom Kippur, the earlier quote I just mentioned from the sages seems to really contradict the notion of the righteous and wicked being sealed in Rosh Hashanah. First, I mentioned from them, they said judgment is decreed for man on Rosh Hashanah and their faith is sealed on Yom Kippur. How can the righteous and wicked be sealed in Yom Kippur if, they, if the Chazal just said that, oh, the righteous and wicked are both sealed in Rosh Hashanah, but only the Baonim are sealed in Yom Kippur? This looks like a big, big contradiction. But yet, this is what is taught or is reviewed during this holiday period in every synagogue, at least in the Orthodox world. It is a major piece of teaching. There has never been a single human being in the face of creation that has been sealed on both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Never has, never will be. A person is either righteous or wicked when they are sealed on Rosh Hashanah. Why do I know that? Because the scripture tells me that. Daniel 12, 1 through 2. You can cross-reference that with Yeshua's words in Matthew 25, 26. There will be some who will rise to eternal life. Righteous, and some will rise to eternal death. Wicked. It's either one or the other. How can a person be sealed on both days? It makes no sense. While we look for the answer, the question we have to ask is what does Chazal mean that Rosh Hashanah, that on Rosh Hashanah, when three books of judgment are open, that the righteous and wicked are both sealed? A net day on Rosh Hashanah. Okay, we just passed Rosh Hashanah 10 days ago from Erev Rosh Hashanah. Look outside the window of life and ask yourself, how many wicked people have you seen died in the last year? How many? Did every single wicked person die off the face of the earth? No. In fact, it seems that they keep multiplying and increasing like gremlins. You know, you remember that movie? Fit after the night and the little mogwais, they keep increasing. What about righteous people? How many righteous people were teleported to Alam Haba? Scotty, beam me up. How many? We, we didn't see any of that. Or better yet, how many Zadikim righteous people experience a worry-free life? Can you find one righteous person that's been exempt for trials and tribulations? Or one righteous person who actually went to Alam Haba? Zero. So the answer is no. And that means the question is, how can sages say that the righteous and wicked are sealed on Rosh Hashanah? I bring this up because it's very pivotal for you to understand. You're observing Rosh Hashanah, you're observing Yom Kippur, you need to know what it means. If these questions seem to baffle us, it proves one thing to us. And you know what that thing proves? It proves that we do not know what a righteous and wicked person is. We don't have a clue. Rabbi Nassim ben Ruvain, he's known as the Ran, he explained to his disciples that a righteous person is not somebody who's performed more commandments than transgressions, and a wicked person is not someone who performed more transgressions than commandments. Rather, a righteous person is somebody who has decided that God has decided to give life to, and a wicked person is somebody that God has decided to take in life from. The terms is a deek. Righteous and rasha, wicked, are titles that basically reflect a person's outcome. So here, Rabbi Nassim feels that what the sages are saying is that just because a person carries himself in a pious manner and hardly sins, doesn't mean that he's really a righteous person. It's up to God to decide. He judges. And that a person who carries himself in what appears to be an impious manner it's not technically an evil person. Everything is determined in the heavenly court. The righteous person, if he's found guilty, okay, he gets judgment. 
the person that was wicked, but then they repented, okay, they get life. So what about the Baonim, these middle class of people? Where do they hang out at? Well, once again, their judgment is suspended till Yom Kippur. I'll get back to these Baonim in a little bit. Yom Kippur will be the final court hearing for the Baonim. And so this is Rabbi Nassim ben Ruvain's position. I take a slight issue with his position. And the reason why is because biblically speaking, what is the definition of life? Is it food? Is it clothing? Is it shelter? Is it money? Is it happiness? Is that the definition of life? Absolutely not. And if you think it is, then you're living in a bubble, my friend. You're in a glass house, and I'm going to throw some rocks to it because I want to wake you up. That's not the definition of life. So while I like the definition of what describes righteous and wicked, I had to disagree. So I want to mention now Tosafists. Tosafists were a group of medieval rabbis that were basically professionals in the Peshat, the literal reading of the Word of God and the literal reading of the sages. These were like the Bereans that are mentioned in the Brachasha, the Tosafists. They were basically medieval Bereans. And they explain that when the sages say that the righteous are sealed on Rosh Hashanah, it means that they are sealed for Alam Haba, the world to come. And that the wicked are sealed for death. And so, in my opinion, Tosafists will agree with me. This is my take on it. Not that I'm anyone special, but as I explained last night, we were not created for this world. We were created for the world to come. Our position in this world determines our position in the world to come. And what I mean by position is how we experience life, how we endure trials and tribulations, what our attitude is like in perseverance will determine our outcome in judgment. People go through life with a sour puss face, angry, depressed, upset all the time, always kvetching, complaining. What do you think your judgment's going to be? Come on in. I got this brand new 18-story mansion here for you. Mashiach himself personally built it. That's not going to be a welcome committee you're going to get before you go to the heavenly court. Once again, we were created for Olam Haba, our position our status, our attitude in this world determines how we get there. When we prayed on Rosh Hashanah, if you recall in your mind, it was not in reference to Alam Hazay. We didn't pray for life. Lord, give me more life so I can experience another 20 years of playing golf. Lord, give me another 10 years so I can go out on my yacht. That's not what we prayed for. That wasn't the type of life we requested on Rosh Hashanah. We didn't pray for life to enjoy more vacationing and any other modern day pleasures in the world. When we prayed for life on Rosh Hashanah, it was in reference to the world to come. Eternal life. The definition of death on Rosh Hashanah, when the sages say that the wicked are sealed for death, means to be cut off from Olam Haba. To be cut off from eternal life. The source of eternal life, the Machor Chaim. Well, what about the Be'onim? What about these middle class of people? Which young keeper are they hanging on to? The one for last year or the one three years from now? Before we can even answer that question, we need to reconcile the apparent contradiction where Chazal teach that all are written on Rosh Hashanah, but then they're later sealed on Yom Kippur which represents a two-step judgment. But later they say both the righteous and wicked are sealed on Rosh Hashanah and it's only the Be'onim who are sealed in Yom Kippur. One-step judgment. And also the Be'onim, another thing I took with this issue is Hashem leaves their book wide open. It's not sealed. On Rosh Hashanah, it's open. You could go in there and hang out with them. There's no cover, no security padlock, no ADT. You could go in there. Their book is left open. Only the books of the righteous and wicked are sealed. Okay. The reality is, Chazal explaining to us that there are two forms of judgment taking place simultaneously. 
One judgment refers to this world we live in, Olam Hazeh, and the other judgment refers to the world to come, our eternal position. When the sages say that all are judged on Rosh Hashanah and all are sealed in Yom Kippur, they are referring to this world, Olam Hazeh, a person's health, a person's finances, a person's life, their longevity is determined on Rosh Hashanah. This is why Chazal say all, call, all Anishim, all men, both righteous and wicked, are inscribed and judged on Rosh Hashanah and their faith is sealed on Yom Kippur. Why? Because on Yom Kippur, what sins are not atoned for? Sins between a man and a man, which is why if you got an issue with your fellow man, you need to go pay peace with him before Nila service tonight. Because Hashem will say, okay, Mr. and Ms. So-and-so holds a grudge. Let me see what I have in my calendar for the coming year for them. I think in the middle of July when they're planning that vacation to the Bahamas, they'll see a deficit in their wallet. Or maybe their health, chas shalom. This is real stuff. Getting a phone call this morning that my father-in-law is in the hospital. That's real. Hashem determines that. If you don't think so, okay. I'll wait till you pastor in this world and you check with the creator upstairs. Nothing happens by coincidence in this world, friend. Everything is determined by the heavenly court. This is why before the gates are closed and Yom Kippur is sealed, you need to make peace with your brother, your family member, your friend. Because only sins between God and man atone on Yom Kippur, not between man and man. Therefore, both the righteous and wicked are judged together in this world. The reference to the three books of judgment deals strictly with Olam Haba, the world to come, as is brought down, as I quoted in Revelation chapter 20, 12. Books were open. Yochanan was in the realm of the spirit when he saw those books open. And he saw what was transpiring from this world to the world to come. He wasn't looking at Olam Haze. He was looking at Olam Haba. This concept has been demonstrated in the Shimon Yesre. The liturgical prayers for Rosh Hashanah, which we just recited last week and we just recited today. Where there's four additional blessings added to the Shimon Yesre in relation to honoring Hashem our King. The first one was right after the vote. Where we say, Remember us for life, O God who desires life. And inscribe us in the book of life. That's a reference to Alam Haba. That life we're requesting, the Sefer Hachaim, that's the world to come. The next one, right after the giver wrote, was Micha Moka Avarachaman. Who is like you, merciful Father? Zocher Yitzrav Lachaim Barachimim, who recalls his creatures mercifully for life. That's another reference <clears throat> to the world to come. Because God recalls everything on that day. The next one, the next two actually, which deals with, after, um, excuse me, <clears throat> which deals with. Uh, Children of the covenant during the Moedim, where we say, Uktov Lachaim Tovim Kov Benevritecha, and inscribe all your children in the covenant for a good life. That's a, refer that's a reference to this world. Inscribe us for good life in this world, because we're the children of your covenant. The covenant of God is bound to this world. And then the last one is after Sim Shalom. We say, Besefer Chaim Baracha Vishalom. In the book of life, blessing, peace, good livelihood. You don't, who needs a bank account in heaven? Last I checked, no one has ATMs, debit cards, credit cards, cashier's checks. There's none of that going on there. There's no Wall Street in heaven. So why, why do I have to pray for Parnosa in the world to come? Because it's not referring to the world to come. It's referring to this world. The first two blessings are Alam Haba. The last two blessings are Alam Hazeh. There's a difference. And you know what? A lot of people go and they read those words, they read those words, and they only have a single clue which one is two. A lot of people are thinking it's their position here. So you're praying the words for Alam Haba, and you think it refers to Alam Hazeh. That shows you where a person's head is at. They're earthly-minded. 
The only question that needs to be asked, and ties into a question I also asked last night, if there are two sets of judgment placed upon us, meaning get judged for our place in this world and we are judging for the world to come, why does God judge our position for the world to come from our activity in this world? Why not wait till we pass away from this world and then judge us in the world to come? That way, I mean, he could closely monitor our actions. He could see our thought patterns, our speech, how we behave with the angels and other people. See if we act the same way there or we act here. So why not just give us judgment there? Why judge us for Alam Haba based upon our actions here? If we're already going to be judged here for how we're going to have a good life through the year. A lot of good complex questions. I hope you're taking note. But as I explained last night, we were solely created not for this world. We were created for the world to come. And this is why Hashem uses this world to determine our position in the world to come. God is not judging us in this world to determine if we would gain a share in Alam Haba or not. Pay close attention to what I said because it sounded like I just contradicted everything I just said. God is not judging us in this world to determine our share in the world to come. What do I mean? Stay tuned. There are certain things in this world that are relevant right now. What do I mean? Certain judgments which are relevant that need to take place to help us to help determine whether we make it to Alam Haba, such as being tested. There's a nice little passage found in Masay Hashalachi in the book of Acts, chapter 422. I think most people, they, they, they hit speed read when they go by it. But it sticks out in gold. It says the only way to enter the Makul HaShemayim, the kingdom of heaven, the world to come, is through trials and tribulations. You attempt to get around it, you will never even get to the gate of heaven. The only way to get to Alam Haba is trials and tribulations. So once again, certain judgments are relevant for a person in this world because it determines their place in the world to come. But I just said God doesn't determine their place, so who determines it? Just wait. And even more, on top of that, another, someone could argue with me and say, regardless of the judgments we experience in this world or the health in the world to come, at the end of the day, God is still using this world as a conduit to minister judgment through. He's not using parts of Alam Haba. Why, instead of sending my brother as a newtnik to argue with me all the time, can't he send an angel? Why can't I have animosity with an angel? Why does he have to send my boss? Or maybe a mother-in-law or someone in the family I have bitterness to. Why does he have to use someone from this world to determine my spot in the world to come? Why can't he just send a couple malachim down? He did it with Jacob, right? Jacob got into a nice wrestling match. It wasn't on WWF back then, but he got into a wrestling match and he won. So he did it for Yaakov. Why can't he do it for me? Why does he have to send me my grandmother? I love my grandmother, by the way. <laughs> so why? Why does he still have to use this world? If this is the case, then why, according to the sages, must Hashem use two judgments? He judges me here, and he's going to judge me there. Once again, friend, our position in Olam Haze, trials and tribulations... Judgments determine our place in the world to come, which is a reward for passing the trials and tribulations in this life. Sickness, financial, marital issues, all of these are trials and tribulations. Your attitude to them, towards them determine your outcome. You respond negatively, you just prolong your experience in this world, and it'll be miserable. But then you'll learn once you check out of here and you find Scotty's teleportation device to get to Alam Haba, you'll realize it's not that easy to get in because you fail to respond positively in the power of God's spirit towards the tribulations and judgments God brought you in this world. If a righteous person is simply a title that reflects the concept that God decides to give life 
to a person and a wicked person, a Russia, is simply a title that reflects the concept that God decides to take life from them. Then what about the Baonim? What about these middle class? This has really been bothering me. This is middle group of people that get to hang out between a rock and a hard place. How is life and death decided for these people? Well, as I explained last night, a Benoni is neither righteous and is neither wicked. It's someone who's caught between righteousness and someone caught between wickedness. They're suspended. But yet their suspension is like someone hanging on a gallow. They may not experience death yet. Death is possible. And therefore, a Benoni can choose between one of the two. According to some of the scripture references I just gave about the book of life and the various books of judgment, the Brich Hadashah teaches that if a person has made authentic, sincere shuva with confession of sin and accepted Mashiach as their Yom Kippur offering, they are inscribed in the book of life. Guaranteed. You would say, well, Rabbi, doesn't that appear to contradict what the sages say, that the righteous are inscribed on Rosh Hashanah for Alam Haba? No, it's not a contradiction. Once again, a righteous person is somebody that God has decided to give life to. Yochanan 10.10. Yeshua says, the thief does not enter except to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to bring them what? Life. And the fullness of their sufficiency. Who decided to bring us life? He did. As he told me and his disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And therefore, a righteous person is somebody that God decides to give life to. This means that an authentic believer... And Mashiach can be inscribed and sealed as a Zadik in the Sefer HaChaim, the Book of Life. The question is, how is that possible if they still exist in this world? Imagine. You go to a friend's house. And you tell that friend that you are a Ben Bias. What's a Ben Bias? It means that you're the son of a certain home, of a certain rabbi. You're the Ben Bias of Rabbi so-and-so, and you're saying all these things. In other words, even though you may not be biologically from that family, because you're so committed to the rabbi of the home, you're like a son or a daughter. So you tell this individual, well, I'm a Ben Bias, and you've been hanging out in their home now for a month. And they say, what's up with this? You're a Ben Bias to this guy, but you've been living in my home. Why don't you consider yourself a Ben Bias here? Shouldn't that make you a Ben Bias of my family? Does physical location change a person's uh, spiritual position? No, it does not. The sages are saying that a Zadik is what we call a Ben Olam Haba, a son of the world to come. He is a person who belongs to life in the world to come, regardless of his physical location in this world. What did Yeshua say? You are in the world, but not of the world. Okay, so which world do you belong to then? If you're not a Ben Olam Hazay, you're a Ben Olam Haba. Even though you physically dwell here, your true residence is considered to be a part of the heavenly world. And therefore, a righteous person's position in this world does not subtract from their position in the world to come. And the same thing can be applied to the wicked person. A wicked person is called a Ben Gehenna, a Ben Satan. Sound familiar? Yeshua wasn't just throwing trash talk at the Jews. It's actually filled throughout rabbinic writings. They called each other Ben Satans. Why? What's a Ben Gehenna or a Ben Satan? It's a person who dwells in Alam Haze, but their residence is 666 Gehenna Avenue. That's where their real residence is at. And they're called a Russia. They're a wicked person inscribed in the book of death. They don't have to be down there yet. They're just waiting for the barbecue to warm up. They want a nice shish kebab, right? 
a nice bowl of chalent where they get everyone mixed in there. This can also be compared to someone who's called what we call a ben Torah, a son of Torah. For instance, if you go and see Rabbi Zeke working out at the gym, does it mean that my hour at the gym changes my position from being a ben Torah? No, <laughs> because I'm not walking around with a Torah scroll or a book in my hand the whole time lifting weights. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't take my position away. If a person is truly connected to Mashiach, who is the real Zadik, whose righteousness surpasses all righteousness, then they are connected with the Machor Chaim, the source of life. And therefore, they are considered a Ben Olam Haba, a son of the world to come, while they physically live in this world. Why? Because they are in the world, but they are not of the world. Therefore, a person's connection with Mashiach allows them to reflect the light of life even while they exist in the darkness of this world. It's also interesting to point out that the sages explain that the righteous, even if they die, are considered to be alive, while the wicked, even though they're physically alive, they're considered to be dead. Never mind the passages I can refer left and right in the Torah about this. When Yaakov died, he was considered alive. Moshe had died, he died, he considered alive. Let me go to the Brecha Shah itself. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, in Ephesians chapter 2, 1, and in Ephesians chapter 2, 5, Rashul tells us that prior to Mashiach, we were what? Dead. What do you mean? I saw you at the supermarket last week, Yonkel. You were getting the corned beef on sale. You were perfectly alive. Shaul says, no, you were dead. Why? Because of your sins. And then what did he say? But through Mashiach, you were what? You had CPR, he made you alive. He blew the breath of life into you. And in Yochanan 11, chapter 25, Mashiach says, I know he, I am the resurrection and the chachaim, the life. The one who believes in me, hama amin hey gam ki yamut. Even if he physically dies, guess what he's considered? Alive. So yes, Chazal is right. That when the righteous do die, they're still considered alive. And the wicked, while they're physically alive, they're considered dead. There are a lot of dead people. You know, you see in the news when people were drug overdosing on bat salts in Miami. And all this other stuff, eating people's flesh like cannibals. Talking about, oh, we're going to have a zombie apocalypse. Go to Yorkdale Mall right now. You'll see plenty of walking dead. There's a lot of people who are alive and they're dead. Go right to the mall. Go into 401. They're dead. And they don't even know it. What makes a believer of Sheikh more alive than an unbeliever who is considered dead though he is physically alive? What makes him? Well, the Marsha, Rabbi Shmuel Eliezer, he answers this question by asking, what is What is the source of life? Is the source of life Alam Hazay? Is it food, clothing, shelter, your new shoes and your new car and your new home with the pool in the back? Is that how you arrive at excitement and joy? Is, is life, Chaim, and Olam Hazay defined by 70 years of existence and the advancement of medical technology that can get you alive till 90, even though you can't walk? How is that, Chaim? How is that life? The true source of life is Olam Haba, the world to come. The wicked that have no connection to the world to come are cut off from life. In this world and in the world to come. Thus the wicked are dead while the righteous are alive. According to the sages, the book of life and death represent those who are either connected to the Machor Chaim or those who are cut off from the Machor Chaim, the source of life. This is serious stuff now. The righteous and Mashiach always have a good connection to Alam Haba, even though they live in this world. They have four Gs, you know, they got five bars on reception. 
They're always connected. They never have poor cell connection like the wicked who probably have something like TELUS or something. I don't know. <laughs> the Bayonim, they haven't decided which contract they want yet. They're deciding. Like it's Rogers, Bell, TELUS, I don't know, Wind. I don't know yet. How could it be that the wicked... This is another question. How can it be that the wicked who were given life by God, the source of all life, of all creation, are actually cut off from the life that was given to them? How can they be cut off? While Hashem deposited life into all creation from when he spoke, he withholds his Shekhinah, his divine presence from those who do not have a kosher lifestyle. I explained this thoroughly last night by quoting from the altar Rebbe, Rabbi Zalm Eliadi explained that a person blocks the flow of God's presence from entering their soul when they sin and they keep the Shekhinah, God's presence, in exile. But when they make a proper, sincere, genuine shuva, that blockage is removed and God restores them back to life. The wicked, because of their sins, they put a separation between them and Hashem. They don't live a kosher lifestyle. While the wicked may be in full physical health, they can be top-of-the-line athletes. They can look excellent. They look like Fabio. Hair looks good. You got good protein there. You're going bald, right? Even though they may look in great physical physique, they're still considered dead because they're cut off from the machuqaim. They're cut off from the source of death or the source of life, excuse me. This is why the Mashiach... And the Shekhinah and rabbinic writings are called Ma'im Chaim, living waters. A living source of water. The physical absence of Mashiach may be compared to the physical absence of water from a lake, but has a spring within it. You would say, well, Mashiach is absent, things seem to be dried up. No, friends, Mashiach is the spring that produces the water. He's abundant with life and he's able to give it at any time. So while it may look like things are dried up, that's not the case. The wicked are like a, a body of lake, a body of water, and they have no actual fresh outlet to get the water from. Once it goes dry, that's it. It's dead. They have no eternal life. When Hashem created man, He created man in three parts. He created us with what's called a nefesh. He created us with a ruach, and he created us with a neshama. Three parts. Genesis 2-7. The nefesh, it is what every single thing in creation has in it. The trees, photosynthesis, the cow, the Easter grass that you get hamburgers from, your cat, your dog, the snake, the gazelle, the lion, the zebra, whatever. Everything has a nefesh. That is the basic minimum function of life in this world. That's something that we have. And so the nefesh represents what we call the animal instinct. The nefesh represents our animal soul. For instance, we're fasting. When you start craving food, what part of you wants to eat? Your hand? Is your hand satisfied? I just got to pick it up. Is it your teeth? Your mouth? As soon as the food goes right down your esophagus, your mouth doesn't care. It's just a conduit just to get the food to one location. Your stomach? No, because as soon as your stomach dissolves everything and you go through the circle of life there, something repeats. So what part of you is craving the food? It comes from your chucha, which is your inner yearning of your animal nature. It craves something in the flesh. The nefesh has no independent way of life. The nefesh is connected to the ruach, what we call spirit. And the ruach stands in the middle between the nefesh and the neshama. The neshama is the image that man was created in. Vayif pach, when Hashem blew a piece of himself, the man, nishmat, neshama. The ruach stands between both of those. It's suspended. Like a Benoni. 
between two worlds. The nephish always desires to go the way of the world. It craves the flesh. It has an attitude. It doesn't want to be told how to do things or how to be corrected. It wants to lay this gadget. It wants to do things its way. It wants to derive every single physical pleasure it can from this world. That's the nephish. It's our animal instinct. And the shama, on the other hand, doesn't care an ounce about this world. No interest. The neshama derives no satisfaction if who's playing in the NBA playoffs or who's going to be in the NHL this year. The soul doesn't care. Why? Because it derives complete satisfaction, not from Alam Hazay, but from Alam Haba, from the very divine presence of God. And so what happens is the Ruach stands in suspension between these two. It's been schlepped from this way over to this way. Oh, it's Shul Yom Kippur. I'm going to go diving and fast and I'll be holy. Monday, I'm going to go down and get my plane ticket to go to the Bahamas. The Ruach is being schlepped left and right. Left and right. You know who told me? You know who tells us they also had the same problem? Rav Shul did. Romans 7, 19 through 24. I'm being pulled to do this, and I don't want to do it. And I'm being doing that, and I know I should do it. And the guy sounds like he needs a psychiatrist. Sounds like many of us. Rashul speaks about his frustration of being schlepped between the spiritual and physical desire. A person is battling between their two natures in life. Do I choose the nephish? Do I choose the neshama? Which one? The reason why the wicked are cut off from the machor chayim, from the source of life, is because they disconnect their ruach from the nefesh. And so all they are left with are animalistic desires to survive in a dog-eat-dog world. Look at our politicians. Look at city officials. Look at rebels and renegades. That's all they live on is survival of the fittest, the king of the hill mentality. I'll knock you down if you come up my hill. That's an animal. The nephish has no connection to the neshama, and therefore a person is considered dead. In the eyes of Hashem, a person who only has the nephish is considered an animal. What do animals do? Come on, you all seen National Geographic or been taught from when you were a kid? Animals like to eat. They love to drink. They love to sleep. And yes, they love to mate. You ever seen mating calls go out? Some of those male animals can't even contain themselves. That's what animals like to do. And that describes 95% of the human race. 95% of the human race loves to eat, loves to drink, loves to sleep, and loves to fornicate. According to the Torah, you want to know what animals were only fit for? One thing. One thing. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. In order to experience life, you must slaughter your nephish, your animalistic desire. That's it. You have to slaughter your animalistic desire, your nephish, because you're spiritually dead. When Chazal say that the righteous are inscribed and sealed for life, it does not mean that God has made a decree of judgment that so-and-so is decreed for life. In other words, what I just mentioned before, God does not determine your share in the world to come. He does it. God does it sit up before the angels. Listen, everyone, quiet down. Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so have been decreed for Chaim. They're coming to Ulamaba, get their bunk bed ready. He doesn't do that. Hashem does not issue a decree. The inscription and sealing of life, guess who it depends on? Us. Remember this concept called free will? God doesn't force his will upon anyone. He leaves that up to us. 
He provides the means. He leaves the rest up to us. If that messes with your theology, I'm sorry. You need to go back to school. I'll tutor you if you want. I'll show you exactly where you went wrong at. Hashem does not sh give a share for us in the world to come. It's based on us. Ask the person that's depressed. How'd you get depressed? Oh, you know, I was walking downtown on Bloor and out of the sky. Boom, this cloud just hit me. And I got depressed. I haven't been the same since. Get out of here. Depression happens over time. A person allows himself to get depressed. A person allows himself to get angry. A person allows himself to become filled with lust. Oh, I was just walking down on Queen's Way, and next thing you know, boom, the spirit of prostitution hit me. Like Aaron told Moses, I don't know, it just jumped in the fire. No. We do that. We get ourselves into the rut. And yes, Baruch Hashem, God is there to help us get out. But to determine how we get out, he leaves it on us. Why do you think Mashiach told his Talmudim through the angels, you Galilean, what are you doing with your heads in the clouds? Get, get, to, get to work. The restoration of Israel is now in your hands. Mashiach did his part. Now you do the rest. Hashem does not make the decree. So and so is here. Roll up the red carpet. No. The inscription and sealing of life depends on us. If we choose life, then Hashem will give us life. If we choose death, then guess what? Hashem will give us death. How do I know that? Parsha Nitzavim, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. Go read it in stone. Or read it in the pages of your Bible, your tablet, whatever you got it on. Moshe. Before you today is Chaim. Before you today is Mavet. Before you today is Bracha. Before you is Uchlala. Life, death, curses, blessings. You pick which one. My wife goes to the store with me. I'm looking in the aisle. I'm a real newtnik when I want something. Should I get this? Should I get that? And guess what I asked her? Hey, sweetie, should I get this? You know what she says? I don't know. You get what you want to get. Now I know why my mother used to say that to my father all the time. Picked it up from him. And you know what happens? If I send her out to do it, I don't like what she gets. I still have to go back and get it myself. The choice is ours. We choose life or we choose death. God doesn't force his will upon us. When a person decides to wake up from their death-like state, to wake up from their sins and accept Mashiach in order to connect their nefesh, their animal soul to the neshama, they have made a free will decision to choose life. They have made that personal choice. So what about the Be'onim? What does it mean that they're suspended between life and death? Well, in one way, that describes us. The Be'onim represent people who are confused. They don't know how to make a decision. The Be'onim are in between life and death. They don't know if they want their Ruach to go to the Nefesh. They don't know if they want their Ruach to go over to the Neshama. They can't make up their mind. And so what do they look like? They look like a dog that goes in circles, chasing its tail. They don't know what to do. The Be'onim is a person who is still pulled in both directions. And the truth is, without Mashiach, we are all Benonim. Every single person on the face of the earth is a Benoni. Without the Mashiach. Like Rashul in Romans 7, 19-24, we are pulled between the Nefesh and the Neshama. And you know, I want to diffuse this big fat lie that's even in Jewish circles. Oh, so-and-so, he was a great Zadik. The Rebbe so-and-so, he was the Rosh Hashiva at this academy. Oh, he did this and that. And people think, I don't need the Mashiach. Rebbe so-and-so was a Zadik. You know, I'm going to bust a bubble right now, because even in the Talmud, the sage Rabbah, 
who was one of the greatest and exalted sages in his day, highly learned and trained, gifted in God's spirit. They all called him the Zadik of the generation, the great man of God. And you know what he told them? Don't ever call me a Zadik. I'm a Benoni. They were shocked. What are you kidding me? We can't even hold a candle next to you. Putting a candle next to you is like putting a flashlight to the sun. And you're saying that you're a Benoni? We're Benoni. You're a Benoni? Why is he saying? Why is he saying he's a Benoni? Because sometimes I choose between life and sometimes I'm between death. I'm not this great Zadik. Only the Mashiach is. Why? Because the Mashiach has no interest in the Nefesh. He only has interest in the Neshama. That's why he came to bring life, not death. Furthermore, this is why the sages say in Perkei Avot, do not believe in yourself until you die. Don't put any trust in your righteousness. That's why when we recite the liturgy, we pray in Yeshua's name. We have no merit of our own. I don't care how many mitzvot a person does. You could do all the mitzvot from Adam to the end of the world, and you're still not righteous. Only the Mashiach has the power. As I shared the quote from Ram Call last night, only he is able to erase the sins from Adam to the future. So what's the purpose of Yom Kippur? A Yom Kippur, we wear white. We fast. Yom Kippur is the time that the nephish is turned off. He has an off day. The animal soul is put on the shelf. We take the animal soul off. We put it in the closet. It's staying there. It's a day that we experience Olam Haba and Olam Hazay. We get a mean, a little taste of what it's like. This is why when we fast, we don't wear sath cloth. We wear white. And this is why the sages say, whether you recognize it or not, Yom Kippur is the happiest day of the year. What are you, crazy? I'm fasting. I'm starving here. Get the barbecue ready. See, the problem is your mind is backwards. You don't even understand what Yom Kippur is. Because you should be immersed in prayer. You know why? We are dressed like this and why we fast? Because angels, friends, wear white garments and they, don't, they, they are not sustained on physical food. They're sustained on the heavenly manna. What do you think you're going to eat when you get up to heaven? Going to go to Dr. Lafa's on Bathurst over here? Let me get a shawarma on Lafa bread or pita? You're going to go to Tov Lee? I like to get a pizza. No. I don't know. I didn't check the menu, but last I checked, I don't think it's going to be there. We will be sustained on the manna of God's presence just as the angels are, which means there will be no hunger pains. You'll wear a white garment. Your fleshly soul nature of the animal will be completely removed. That's why we do these things on this day. And the reason why Chazal say that the Benonim are sealed on Yom Kippur is because it's on Yom Kippur that the Benonim have to decide where to cast their vote at. Do I want to continue to go away to Nefesh or am I going to go the way in the Shama and I'm not going to go back to the way to Nefesh because according to the Torah, Shuvah means don't go back that way. As I quoted last night, the definition of Shuvah means do not return back to the sins you were committing. Or as Shaul say, let no sin reign in your mortal body. That means a person has to come to terms of what this day represents, what it's a reflection of. And if they're going to get to that reflection, they need to turn away from the nefesh. They need to make a complete shuva, return to Hashem in order to be pure. So what is it, friends? Where do you cast your vote today? We're not talking parliament. We're not talking about the White House. We're talking about the heavenly court. We're talking about your very existence that is not defined by this world alone, but the world to come. Where do you cash your vote at? Do you desire life or do you desire death? 
When you go before the eternal king, you can't say, Hashem, no, this is wrong. You're putting me, death on me. What type of cruel God are you? You know what Hashem's going to do? Hold on one second. Bring me my mirror. It's just sticking in front of you. And he says, you want to accuse someone? Look right here. You brought this upon yourself. You're guilty. You chose death. I simply provided you the means to choose either or. And if you think that you're a Zadik on your own terms and friends, guess what? Because as I mentioned, the sages in the Talmud even called themselves Benoni. Without Mashiach, we're all Benoni. We are all torn between the flesh and the spirit. We're all torn between life and death. And we can't be committed to either or. The choice is yours. This is a significant day, friend. I don't know how many more Yom Kippurim are upon us. I don't know how many more Rosh Hashanahs will come until that one shofar blows. And that's it. God closes up shop. Because, you know, like I said, Hashem is like a, a banker or a storekeeper. He gives a loan. You know what happens when you don't pay your loan? It gets interest. So every time you don't make shuva the proper way, you get an interest charge. And eventually, if you go into debt, some countries, they just throw you in prison. The prison that Hashem has, I don't think you want to go there. I don't think you want to be called a Ben Gehenna, a Ben Satan. I don't think you want to be labeled a Russia, a wicked person. For your sake, I hope that you really contemplate. And yes, if we are authentically striving to follow the footsteps of Mashiach, then we are inscribed. But let me tell you something. Don't temper the seal. It's like buying a piece of electronics. What's it say there? You remove the seal, void the warranty. Don't void your warranty, friend. Like I mentioned last night, Yom Kippur has blood, but that's just one part. It also involves, it involves confession of sin and it involves shuva. Those are the three main ingredients for Yom Kippur to be successful to grant you atonement. So a lot of believers say, well, I got the Mashiach. Hallelujah. The dance or two, Texas two-step or something like that, right? Okay. But did you make a genuine shuva? Have you confessed your sins? Have you returned from being bitter, anger, or whatever it may be? Have you confessed that? If not, the blood of Mashiach does nothing for you. Just like the blood of the Yom Kippur offering did nothing for the Jewish people. It doesn't change. It works the same way. You need all three ingredients for you to have a Yom Kippur atonement. So we got the Mashiach. But the other ones, are we suspended here, deciding, do I forgive that person? Do I continue in my addictions? Do I continue going the way of the nefesh? Or do I make an authentic Shuva return to God, and I don't dare even think about going that way again. That's up to you. That's up to me. And whatever areas we may be struggling with, this is why this day is, a very, is the holiest day of the year. Because this determines whether you get the picture or not. You may not have been baited in on Rosh Hashanah. Oh, this is nice. This is good sermon or good teaching. I don't know if I'm you know, really convicted about that. But then after you hear Yom Kippur, oh, geez, i got to make a decision now. Which one is it going to be? I know, friends, but time is running short. None of us are promised tomorrow. And this world is not promised forever. So the decision is going to be between you and me. We either choose life or we choose death. And I pray that we all here would choose life and merit life in the source of light, the Machor Chaim, Mashiach Yeshua himself. Amen. Amen.